Welcome to another edition of the Two World Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jacob, and I have with me today... I am Barney. And Barney and I have been talking about ideas for this most recent episode, and we really are intrigued by things that have been lost and then found. That could apply to objects, but it could also apply more broadly to relationships. And so we're going to be taking this episode as a chance to explore things in our lives that have been lost and found. And we're really hoping that as we do this, that you too can connect with your own experience there. And just to get us started, Barney, um, what have you brought today as an example of in your life of something that has been lost and then found? Yeah, I, I wish that I had a longer list just because I lose a lot of things, but I rarely find them again. So I can think of lost puzzle pieces, lost watches, where who knows where they are now. <laughs> Most recently, in fact, I lost my, believe it or not, I lost my Halloween costume. <laughs> so I know. And when I was supposed to wear it to um, teach at a school and I couldn't find it at all, the day before and the day of, and I substituted the best I could with a hockey jersey. But of course, no one knew what I was supposed to be. <laughs> oh man! Oh no! <laughs> Thankfully, that has a happy ending where um, I was cleaning up in a completely unrelated area and found the Halloween costume. You know, which I who knows why I put it there a year ago, but found it and just in time for a later Halloween party at school um nice nice you know, <laughs> yep. and um and then soon after um i got back from america you know oh, it's one of those things when you're getting ready for a trip and then coming back where you have no recollection of half of the things you did at when you return of what you were doing before and i lost a number of things that i needed and thankfully, they were all in one spot, but it still took us about a week. And of course, it was Ayako who is the one who saved the day um, and found them yeah, again in an unlikely spot. So I don't know why I do this to myself. <laughs> well, thank goodness for Ayako. I mean, that's always <laughs> oh, great boy. when somebody <laughs> comes alongside us and helps us when we're searching. Yes. yes. I know. I know. Yeah. And I, I wish I could pay her with, you know, like something substantial, but, but you know, the show my real you know genuine gratitude but. oh my goodness um that reminds me just briefly if i could um of uh -huh. a story when i was working at a church in centerburg ohio uh, helping with a youth group and i lost my keys during one of our youth group oh. activities and <laughs> Um, the whole youth group was helping me. We're combing the, <laughs> the parking lot, which was like a gravel stone parking lot and looking all over and all over. We searched and searched and I found the keys. Fortunately, they were in my other pocket. <laughs> I normally put my keys in my left pocket. And for some reason they were in my right pocket and I never thought to check there. And, you know, when we found it, it was a real groaner. I was so embarrassed you know, and all the kids were laughing. I know. And, <laughs> it was, and the same thing, the same thing happened with my cousin's cell phone. She was visiting. Um, and when they got ready to leave, they were just mm -hmm. going out the door. She's like, Oh, has anybody seen my cell phone? Well, oh, just yeah. a, a few minutes before when they were packing up, I was going through picking up things that were theirs. And I saw her phone. I was like, Oh, I need to get that to Megan. I put it in my pocket and forgot about it. And so we're looking all around the house and trying to find the phone. And so finally her, her dad's like, okay, I'm going to call the phone. So he called it, oh, and no. it rang from my pocket. And I, <laughs> like, oh, pulled it out. like, Oh, here's your phone. Megan. <laughs> Um, uh, yes. Um, but anyway, no, um, wait, yeah. it, these stories have happy endings. We, the objects were yeah, found. So. Oh man. Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh boy. And I know, and about your key story, you know, if my, if my parents are listening, my dad can really relate to that one time when they were just getting back from the airport and he couldn't find his car keys and they were in his shirt pocket. But, um, oh. yeah, I know one of those, the worst thing in your case is um, everyone is helping you and then you you just have to sheepishly say you know just kidding guys you know is it 
April <laughs> Fools or see that wasn't that a great learning experience oh, that we just had? You know? Yes, yes, <laughs> right? it's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. More, more seriously, when when we were thinking of this topic, um, I was trying to recall, you know, from my large, large list of things that I've lost and found again. But um, I think maybe kind of one interesting thing that, um, you know, kind of like lost or forgotten or set aside um, kind of thing where um, I, I, I realized that I had, when I was visiting my parents' home and um, it, it dawned on me that they have this, um, you know, like external um, case that you can hook up a hard drive to and then, you know, through a USB, um, hook that into the computer. So like taking the actual physical hard drive and connecting it, you know, wiring it up and then um, accessing it through, the, through a new computer. And it dawned on me that I could, that I had this piece of equipment and I had my old computers back at home. And that was amazing to see what my hard drive was like in my computer when I was at um, Goshen. And then even I was able to get a hold of, to access my hard drive from my very first computer that I bought in 1995. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I know. And so- Like a time looking, machine. Oh, it really was. And, and still is, I still have all the files, you know, thankfully, you know, saved onto USB and stay, you know, backed up, but to look back at, um, you know, I had like bookmarks, um, from Netscape, if anyone knows what that is right oh now. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and, That's incredible. And I had, I had web pages that I had made and, you know, all of the HTML files and they still loaded up just fine. And, um, you know, pictures that I'd saved. And of course, lots and lots of documents, um, you know, kind of thinking back to our episode where we talked about games and, and playing video games. Um, I had one, one Excel sheet that I'd made about like my fastest lap times on a Formula One video game. Oh my goodness. And, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, um, yeah. And then just the wide range of documents from schoolwork to just like a journal, to poems, um, to just random things that I wrote down, blog entries, things like that. And um, which, I mean, actually back then it was like, it wasn't a web blog. I mean, it was in the truest sense of the form of web blog, like a web page where I just updated it. Wow. Not like what, not like what we have now. And, um, and I even found um, a PowerPoint that I had made for church um really? after that yeah that presentation yeah that i did after my time in thailand and um opening that again and seeing thankfully um whenever i got photos developed i always made sure that um i, I like checked the box to and paid a little bit extra have them put it on cds oh. yeah so i had all of those photos and I could see all that again and remember all of the people that I had spent time with. And um, boy, it was, it, like you said, it was a time machine. And to, to think about myself back then and what I was thinking, what I was doing, you know, with these documents and homework and whatnot. And, and yeah, to see where I was, you know, however, you know, 10, 20 years later when I was rereading all these things and opening the files again, it was really neat. Wow, what a treasure to have that stored away and unexpectedly to rediscover it. And mm -hmm. yeah, the insight it would give you on what you were thinking back then and the reminders of the relationships you had and what was mm -hmm. important to you. And oh, that's that's fantastic. I love that. Wow. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. amazing too that the modern um equipment that we have can access those files and convert them or in our updated programs that they can still be read. It's, it's great that we still have the capacity to, to, you know, un, to open them and to unlock that yeah. information. So, yeah, it, it really is neat. And yeah, to, that, you know, these files that were written on, you know, word 95 or whatever it was, you know, can still open 
was really pretty impressive. And, you know, I even had some quick time files and things like that. And, wow. Yeah. Quick time. Amazing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh. um, and then that, that all kind of put me in mind of, um, uh, like maybe the second thing that came to mind, second big thing that I thought of when thinking of um, lost and found. And, um, you know, around that era, um, when I was in college and then Marquette, you know, I think I mentioned that I had one real dear and close friend from my time at Marquette. And um, yeah, we, she and I um, wrote lots and lots of emails back and forth, I realized. And then um, again, searching through things at my parents' home, I found all of these artifacts that I completely forgot about and realized um, that she had sent me many, many letters and maybe I had sent her some as well. I think that we shared in one of our previous episodes, we shared um, a photo of the St. Joan of Arc Chapel that's on our Kent University campus that she took a picture of and sent to me. And um, yeah, all of the things, rereading of all of those and the little gifts and presents that she had sent to. And then I thought, I'm going to try this email. I only know her one email address. And, and that was back in 1998 when she had been using it. And I just wonder if she's still using it. Um, this was three years ago. And so I just, you know, wrote, you know, how do you do this? You know, um, 20 years later, um, dear Diane, you know, maybe you'd remember me from the ninth floor at McCormick Hall, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And just seeing how you are, I found these things. And, you know, if you have time, you know, whenever you have time, you know, just write me back, you know, just real, real short one. Even though there was a lot that I wanted to say. And yeah, like maybe that same day, then um, she wrote me back. And then it was just like picking up where we left off, getting in touch with she thought you know, catching up and staying in touch and sharing close relationship and real, you know, genuine feelings of caring for one another. And um, yeah, so yeah, thinking of things that you lose or things that you find again or things that you didn't realize you had lost. Um, in term, in in this case, it was both tangible things like the letters that 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 we had, that she'd sent to me and actually losing touch with her, you know, for all those years not have been in contact and not even really crossing my mind. And then being able to find that that link again and, and um, pick up, you know, kind of where we left off. That was really meaningful. And um, it was in it was in a good time, a good place for her. She was, um, you know, things were steady. And then um, I also soon after that, though, things got a little bit rocky. And I felt like, you know, I could be um, a friend for her again in that way. And, and I was really happy for that chance too. Wow. That's an amazing story. It, it's just so fortunate that she was still using that email address. <laughs> I it, know. it makes me think a little bit about some social media platforms like Facebook, how sometimes people are able to reconnect through a platform like that with somebody that they have um, missed I'm talking with from, from years in the past and and so incredible that that it, that opened up for you and I'm so great to, mm. grateful to hear that wow that's mm -hmm. fantastic um for a second I got my wires crossed and I was wondering if you were talking about Lena but Lena was at Goshen right, right. yeah mm -hmm. I don't know why I was thinking she was at Marquette for a second but um mm -hmm. but no um because some of our listeners might and viewers might remember Lena from our previous episodes, but she's another friend from the college era, but from the Goshen right. years, not, not yes. the Marquette yes. time. So yes. Yes. yeah, very that cool. Was from the second hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. 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 Well, um, as you were sharing about that, um, it makes me think of the example that I have brought today. And that is of a set of CDs, two CDs, mm -hmm from the year 2006 in December of that year on December 2nd, my mom gave a talk at our church, the vineyard church in Wheeling, West Virginia. And I had grown up in that church and um, they had invited her to speak at a women's conference that they were putting on called heart to heart. And 
this is the first time I remember her being invited to be a speaker in that way. She is, was really connected to the church through small groups and things, but they recorded those sessions and um, made a CD of it. And my mom gave it to me years ago. And um, in the shuffle of, of moving things and um, organizing them, it, that those CDs moved around our storage areas. Um, and then when we moved homes, you know, they moved with us and um, found new places to hide <laughs> or to, to be kept, I should say. Anyways, um, the other day I was clearing out a drawer and I found them. And um, it's, it's interesting because my mom passed away in August of 2014. And I don't have very many recordings or videos of her. Um, I have some notebooks that she kept later in her life. And I have a few like family videos and I have quite a few photos, but um, anything I find that where she's speaking or um, yeah, sharing, I, I really want to, to watch or listen to it because I just, I miss her so much. And it feels like it's a chance to like understand a little bit more of her story. And so when I got these CDs, I was really excited and I um, started listening to them. And um, I think maybe the hope for me was just in, in listening to them, I could maybe learn a little bit more about her and about our relationship. And it's kind of like when you get older, your parent can be there to give advice as, as you age and as you're parenting, um, they could give examples of what they did or, um, lessons that they learn. And since she died at the age of 60, which I think is relatively young. Um, and I was, um, my children were younger when she died. There's all these questions I have for her that I can't ask, um, uh, directly, but through these CDs, maybe some of these questions I have could be, be partially answered. And so I was fervently, um, combing over and listening very carefully to, um, to them. And I, and I, and I heard a lot of really interesting things. Um, so, um, I wanted to share a little bit about that, but I want to pause for a minute and, uh, maybe ask, like, as you hear that story, do you mm -hmm. think it, it makes sense that I would mm -hmm. have this interest in them or, or what, um, what are your thoughts as you kind of hear that? Yeah. Like kind of putting myself in, in your shoes and, um, thinking about like that kind of moment, um, I and like maybe similar similar connections that I have when I run across something like that. There, there's I have a real hesitancy about it, um, wondering if if I want to kind of step through that door again, if I want to kind of open open this chapter back up again from my life, and um, it, it's kind of a nervous a nervous time for me, you know, wondering either will I kind of spoil the memory or will it kind of open something up different for me or, you know, of course, or will it, um, you know, really um, kind of, like you said, add a lot of depth or a lot of new things to, to my memory. Did, did you feel like some kind of hesitancy or, or were you pretty just really excited when you found those again and, and pause to kind of realize what, what you had at that moment? Um, I didn't feel hesitancy, but um, it ended up being quite hard to listen to. Um, and um, I wouldn't say that it was um, uh, because I didn't come into it with an awareness that it would be, but it quickly wow. became apparent the moment I started playing them because um, a recording about it directed to an audience um, at a specific time in a specific place is intended to speak to them. So um, I'm going into it with the hope that like maybe my mom will speak to me on some level. Right. But her intended audience was not me. I mean, she never probably dreamed that, you know, uh, what was it? 16 years later, her son would be <laughs> listening to her talk in this way. Um, so there were so many times in her talk where she would make a reference to something like tease an idea. I mean, not tease in the sense of like, haha tease, but like put something out there subtle. Mm -hmm. And then 
about her family or about an insight she had, and then she wouldn't flesh it out and she'd move on because she was trying to stay on topic for her audience. And I, and I would be <sighs> thinking, oh, can you say more about that? Or, oh, I would love for you to just t- unpack that a little further. That for me is a really interesting question. Um, so um, yeah, I, I felt like a little bit conflicted when I was listening because like I had appreciated like her exposition and in, in the teaching about scripture and how she was relating to her peers there at the church. That was neat to see. But at the same time, I was like, I just want to, I just want to have some answers to some of these questions. I would love to know more. And um, my mom wasn't particularly one to unpack a lot of her emotions from um, her, her past or um, her early experience of parenting me. Um, she just generally was more quiet. It's not that she was super private, but she was just real quiet and didn't tell a lot of, of those stories. A lot of the stories she shared were from later in life when we were older as kids or her time um, being married to my dad. And so there's all these questions I still haven't. So I guess it was, it's unfair to go to a recording and, and it kind of, and think, oh, you know, <laughs> maybe some of this will be here waiting for me. Um, but it also reveals at the same time, I guess what you would call the the sting of of loss or mourning, mm. when when you there are questions you want to ask and you and you realize, oh well, I have to let go of that. That's that's mm. unanswerable. <laughs> so mm. so um so so to answer your question, I didn't feel apprehension, but pretty quickly um, in listening, I guess I experienced what might cause one to have apprehension yeah. <laughs> before listening. And I, yeah. and I realized, Oh, this is going to be complicated, but um, there were a few moments where I, it became clear to me that it was worth it. And I'm oh. glad that I listened and that the, the discomfort or the frustration um, ended up actually teaching me something. Um, so I was hoping to share a little bit about those. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, I want to pause and give you a chance to respond. Mm. Like, um, are there questions that you yeah. have that you would want to like ask your mom or your dad that they haven't been able to answer yet? Or do you feel like, I mean, being able to visit them or call them, you can still get answers. Is that yeah, something right. that's on your radar? You know? Yeah. I, I wonder if, um, if like being, being the youngest maybe, um, and having had, you know, a lot of my time, you know, especially when my siblings move, you know, went to college and then, and then started their own um, paths away from home, you know, it really always felt like, you know, uh, you know, of course, it's just me and mom and dad, you know, it's just, we're always there together. And then, you know, I it makes you think how much of that have I taken for granted and, and maybe do I still, you know, take it for granted mm. um, that, yeah, of course, they're just going to be there. And, and you're right. It's one of those questions that, um, one of those things that that you want to be able to sit down and 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 talk with them, um, you know, while you still have the chance to. And so I think it hadn't really dawned on me so clearly until um, you know maybe more recently that um, you know with with them um, getting older and um, with me getting older too and my kids getting older. That, yeah, I think there are times where I want to just sit down with them and um, I'm not sure if there are any real questions that I have for them as much as I'd like to, you know, just um, have like, I don't know how to say it, like not, not an, an adult conversation, you know, but like, like just sit down with them as, as people, you know, as not, not necessarily mom and dad, but just as, as, you know, other interesting adults that I want to have, you know, like, an, you know, not like, you know, like, not like a family conversation about, but just hear about them, you know, more. And um, especially about, yeah, how, how it was for them. Um, you know, I heard a lot of growing up stories, but maybe like in the middle part, um, getting through college, finding a career, um, you know, getting, getting settled in and starting in married life, and um, I think I really um, want to be able to show them, you know, tell them how much, um, how thankful I am, you know, for all that they've done and, you know, to show my gratitude. 
Um, that might be yes. kind of the opposite end of being the youngest child where um, there are times where everything feels like it's about you. And so it's harder to to show your gratitude for that because because you start to think everything is about me for sure, you know? Mm. And um, yeah, I want to be able to have the chance to, to tell them that um, in a real genuine way. Um, one thing from your story just now that, brought this thought to my mind, and, and I'm not sure if you can answer it or, or address it or not, but it made me think of um, the times when you're watching um, a really good movie or reading a really good book, and the author or the director or screenwriter or whatnot doesn't exactly finish the story, or, or you want to know what else happened with these characters. And um, yes. you kind of feel like, like you have the responsibility or you have the ability to um, use what you have learned of the character up to that point and, and you know, make make your own kind of, you know, um, what educated, not educated guess, but you, you have like the, the, the tools to kind of predict what might have happened. Do you feel like hearing the CD and having the questions that you had and things you wanted to ask more about, in in light of how you knew your mom and the things that you talked about, like like maybe you wouldn't know the exact answer, but did you feel like maybe you thought maybe the answer was could have been something like this, or or were the questions that you had, um, like you said, just completely unanswerable that, that without knowing this or that key information from your from your mom, you just wouldn't know. Um, no, I I definitely feel like some of my questions were answered and I felt like listening to these recordings at the age that I'm currently at also gives me a different perspective and set of ears to hear certain things that she's sh sharing because when she was talking about parenting uh, and sharing uh, maybe about the complexity of, of wondering um, how will the lessons or the, my approach, uh, shape and form my children in, in their next phase of life as, as they become parents and raise children and the ambiguity of that. Um, she talks about sometimes even having concern or regret, like how she could have done certain things differently. And, and she, in her talk, she gives this example, like, um, sometimes we pray, like we know we've planted seeds and for certain things we, pr we pray for crop failure. She said <laughs> that those seeds, the way, you know, it, it went down or happened, um, won't bear fruit in another generation. Um, and I thought, Oh, wow. Like I never would have thought that my mom would have had such, um, uncertainty about like certain aspects of how she raised us kids. Um, I know, um, I mean, we had shared it over the years about, um, different conflicts that had happened. Um, because, um, my mom told her story to, um, her friends and peers on, on this occasion. And she, there were some things I had never heard before in her story. So it was answering some kind of biographical information questions I had. Um, but then as she shared her story, she was being very vulnerable um, and telling the ladies about certain struggles. And, um, when she, my, my dad, he had been previously married and he had a child, um, through a previous marriage. And so when she came in to the family with my dad, um, he already had a six-year-old daughter, um, uh, who's my half sister. And so, um, she kind of, she, and this is one of those cases where I was like, oh, I would love to hear more. Um, but she kind of acknowledged how it was hard um, you know, starting a family together because, um, they got married six months after meeting each other. They felt such a strong connection. And my sister was six at that time. And then I was born a year and a half later. That was a lot of change for my sister to process, you know, so quickly. Um, and, um, I think that she kind of acknowledged in her talk, but didn't unpack it just how that, that might've been part of some of the um, the uncertainty that she had named and, and, um, 
the struggles that through those years and, and the challenges like of being, a, being family together after the disruption that, that, um, that was caused, you know, just by the fact of the timing of, 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 um, how their relationship came together. And, um, I feel like there's a lot, uh, in, in, of hope in her talk. Um, but a lot of it is, um, kind of the putting on the layering of her hope in Jesus as, as a source of grace on top of like brokenness within her story. And so I think maybe this is one of those things in her talk she's talking about when she looks to Jesus for his grace to say, you know, there were certain things in family life that, um, that were hard that she, she wishes could have been better or more life-giving for everybody, um, growing up. And so I guess I never heard her say that quite in that way. And so when I listen to this talk, I'm like, oh, like I knew, I knew she would talk about like wanting to, um, have a good relationship with, with my sister and, um, what she and my, my dad had wanted for us as children growing up. Um, but I guess maybe I didn't have ears to hear this exactly when I was younger, or maybe it's because she was speaking to her peers and, um, fellow, um, friends and women who had prayed for her through this time, um, that she was able to be vulnerable and say, you know, it was really hard. And I, sometimes I have, you know, struggles and doubts and about how we approached it. So that was pretty huge. And I just sit with that, um, for a while. Um, there are some other things I want to share too, but I want to pause for a minute and is, um, give you a chance to respond. Like, as I'm talking there, is that, would that, are there, have you ever encountered like a family narrative before and then you learn a new piece of information that kind of sheds it in a new light or, or maybe you realize some, something dawns on you that you hadn't quite fully realized before. I mean, that's kind of what I'm sensing was happening with me. I don't know if you can relate to that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I've, I've learned it's maybe, maybe one thing, that that comes to mind right away is um i don't know if it's really a tradition but my mom often likes to tell me like you know the story of when i was born on my birthday oh <laughs> yeah. sweet and and you know you usually kind of kind of know the same you know the same routine you know picking strawberries and you know summertime and she knew it was time and this and that and i recently maybe just last year or two years ago, she, she's like, you know, I, I haven't re I realized I haven't written, you know, so much, you know, I, I realized I've written maybe the same thing a few times, but there's all this more detail that, that she added the one time. And, um, it was really neat to, to be able to hear that and, and read that, um, kind of getting like a, a real full picture of everything that was going on at that time. Um, when, when they were, you know, waiting for me to, to arrive. And, um, yeah. And I think at the same time, that's one of the other things that might be fun to chat with my parents. Cause I know kind of the other stories about when, um, you know, when, when they were getting ready for Craig and when Christine and Jay were getting, were, were going to be born. And, um, and I wonder, you know, if they know all these neat details about me, you know, maybe I need to ask my siblings, do they, has mom written this kind of thing to you too? And, you know, it, it might be fun to hear um, more about how things were, you know, when they were getting ready for my siblings too. Hmm. And um, yeah, but yeah, I've heard other stories, especially um, about my relatives that I never met on my mom's side who, you know, were her grandparents and whatnot. Um, and um, yeah, and a little bit from my dad's side too. And um, when I hear more and more, um, occasionally, yeah, it, especially since these people have passed away, it, um, really makes me like kind of rethink, um, the people that I knew my grandparents to be, or, or, you know, the people that I never met, but heard, heard stories about. Um, and, um, it's, it's great to hear that those kind of stories. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm curious, um, in in your mom's context and the context of this meeting um like you mentioned that she was you know really so open and so vulnerable and in in some 
you know, maybe in some churches to, to tell that kind of story, um, I think maybe the audience would be appreciative to hear it, but maybe some people or, or many people in the audience might um, not receive it so warmly, maybe, or, or might, might take time to really kind of process what they were hearing and, and kind of understand how they feel about that. In, in the context of, of the vineyard church where you, where you were in, in the audience that, that your mom was speaking to, how can, how do you think this, this kind of openness was met? Do you think that, um, was it, was it such an uncommon story that, of what your mom went through or, or was your, the congregation in your church really feel full with, with a, a really diverse range of, of personal stories? Yeah, I think that our church was full of a diverse range of personal stories. And my mom had been connected with that church for 21 years at the point when she shared this message. And so in that amount of time, she was able to develop a lot of um, deeper friendships and relationships um, with the women that she was sharing with. And she was involved with a prayer ministry in the church that was focused on coming alongside people and having deep times of prayer and when they're struggling and that also extended to times in her life when she was struggling, which um, she references in, in her talk that I, as a child, if I wasn't there and she didn't tell me, I didn't know people were praying for her you know, about um, some of these, these things. And so I think it was a very safe place for her to share. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't know maybe what the intent was of making a recording. Cause I don't know how widely it would have been assumed it would ever be distributed, but my mom probably never would have guessed other people would be listening to it outside of that room. Maybe um, like, like her son years later, <laughs> but I, I think she would have been fine with it because I think um, she wanted to share her story and uh, she did actually come to think of it. She did give me those CDs years ago. So I think she was okay. You know, say, what, you know, friends, family listening to it. But at the time, I'm sure she was just probably zeroed in on her immediate audience. But, but yeah, I think it was an environment where uh, vulnerability and opening up like that was welcome. Not the name of the, the series was heart to heart. So it was meant to be oh, yeah. uh, going deeper than just um, uh, informational sharing. Like it was trying to go below the surface to like, what are our deeper core struggles or longings and how do we um, um, support one another and, and thinking about those. So I will say though, like in those, there were moments of vulnerability in the talk. Um, but, but there were times when like, like, uh, I don't want to say it where something was referenced. And I was like, Oh, if only like we could have unpacked it a little bit more because there might be a reference and then to a personal story, but then it would kind of quickly move into like the biblical story and understanding that in a, in a broader theological way. Um, and which I appreciate, but with the type of questions I have, I'm like, Oh, I would love to hear more, you know, the personal sharing. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, would it be all right with you if I shared a few quotes from the, oh, yeah, the talk? Sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm, I thought while I do that, I might share my screen mm -hmm. um, so that you can see a picture of my mom and um, our, our viewers will be able to see it. Um, and I tried to find a picture of her as close as possible to when she gave this talk. Oh. So this is a little bit after December of 2006. This, this picture is actually taken in 2007, but it was close to mm -hmm. the time of the talk. Um, and so this was um, a photo taken in our house um, when actually we were living in Orville. So it would have been your, your grandparents, <laughs> former, former home. Cause we were nice. renting um, from yeah. your parents at the time. And um, uh, uh, at this space, it was a lovely place to raise <laughs> our kids, our first two as they were growing up. And um, so my mom came to visit us and that's where this picture was taken. Uh, but anyway, um, I wanted to share just a little bit um about um, like what she said about aging, I thought was really interesting and how it was empowering for her um, as she got older um, in terms of uh, um, her self-understanding and how she communicated. So I wanted to share a little bit about that. And, um, and then I'd like to connect um, a little bit later to um, the idea of, of um, raising children and grandchildren. And so, um, but here's the part about getting older. Um, 
she says in her talk, um, and I quote, um, we're always learning how to really understand what we think on the inside, what we really feel. And so I appreciate the aging process because the older I get, the more I understand what I feel. When I was younger, I didn't say a whole lot of things. My mother-in-law used to say, speak up um, I, because I was so quiet and reserved. And sometimes it would take me a while to figure out things. And I didn't seem to know people very quickly, but it takes time to figure out these things. And it's taken me a long time to analyze what I really think and how I really feel. And uh, the more I thought about that, I thought, um, my mom did become more vocal later in life, more quick to share her perspective when she disagreed, more willing to share something that she was passionate about, um, and maybe more willing to, uh, to put forth a, to interject a, a question or a comment in a conversation. And when I heard this in her talk, I thought, Oh, that's so interesting. Like she is aware that that's happening in her, that she is becoming more uh, self-aware and recognizing that she has dignity and value and worth in the conversation and that she has the right to narrate and, the, um, and has a place to share her heart and mind and is not holding that back and timidity. And um, I thought, oh, that, that's a very hopeful thing for all of us. That when we're aging, hopefully we realize like if we have been bashful in the past, if we have been reticent, that um, that we can try to start to be more open with who we are and and um, be willing to share that with others. And so, so that was that was um, one example um, from her talk that I wanted to share. And so I'll stop there for a second. Um, and I have another quote, but I want. I wanted to give you a chance to respond as, as you hear that. Um, have you encountered that in your parents as they are aging or maybe in other people that you've seen as they get older, they become more bold or more open with their perspectives? Yeah, I wonder, um, maybe I've seen it in myself. Um, yeah. Um, and I think that, um, you know, especially maybe it's from, um, you know, devotions that I've read or reading the Bible um, more and more and more and really reflecting on that or um, other books that, um, you know, I've, I've really taken, I find in myself that I've really taken the, um, the idea of acting on faith really to heart. And, you know, and other times, you know, back in, in you know, years ago, you know, a few years ago, I would have um, found one reason or, or another not to do something um, that maybe I felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and um, then actually, I think I realized um, also, also in part from um, a TED talk and, and a lesson that I taught at the university um, that, um, you know, there is that moment where you know, you're at, you're at a crossroads, you know, however quick it is, and you think, should I act or not act? And um, I found in myself more recently within the past few years or so that, that I, I have this courage and kind of um, reassurance that it's okay to, to do that act, you know, whatever it is that like you feel empowered, or you feel like it's what you should do. And then I really, you know, uh, a leap of faith, you know, I, I always have in my, my image, my mind, like the scene from, um, the Indiana Jones movie of the, uh, the last crusade where, where he's trying to pass the final test of, you know, stepping out into this chasm where there's no clear path for him and he might just fall. Wow. And, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, he, you know, in, in the story, you know, he has this belief and he's on firm footing, but, um, you know, I found the ability to be bold like that in myself and, and to just trust that, that it'll be okay, no matter, no matter how things go. And, um, yeah, so I, I think 
um, getting older, I found that, you know, in the past, I probably wouldn't have done those things. And you know, maybe also being a parent, but also having life experience that um, I found that, that I'm able to really act on act in faith and in such a way that I kind of look forward to these chances. Because um, I know that not only is it okay, but it, I don't know, feels good. <laughs> you know, it feels great acting in faith and, and just going, going for it. Um, when, when I heard your story just now in the quote, it made me think, um, you know, about, about you as, as who you are and who I've known you to be. And you have the benefit of, um, you know, the household that you grew up in and, you know, you had that firecracker of a, of a grandma he's mentioned that lived just next door. And, um, maybe you had the chance to, um, um, you know, experience being raised by your mom kind of when she was gaining this understanding um, and and insight in her life. And um, so maybe like, did you, maybe you never really experienced this kind of timidity that, that she felt inside, um, you know, when, when of your memories of her, maybe you remembered her more of, you know, like you say, it said, you know, being willing to speak up and, and share her, her feelings and her opinions. And, and then I wonder if like you had that, that kind of positive um, environment, if it like impacted, impacted you and kind of made, um, made you a little bit of who you are now, do you feel? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, um, the example of my mom has had a huge impact on my life and how I view relating to other people. And, um, she was a very, um, kind and friendly outgoing person in, in, in many ways. And, um, she had a gentleness with people. I think I've tried to learn from that and relate with, um, care and respect when I relate with people and, that's been incredibly helpful for ministry. And speaking of ministry, she was very passionate about her faith. And so that was infused in so many things that she did with parenting and just how she lived life in general. So um, that was a huge heritage. She left um, and um, she modeled so much that I benefit from still today in that regard. So um, I think I did see her timidity when I was younger, even though maybe I didn't have the psychological tools to be like, oh, my mom is like, is holding back, you know, in this hard situation, she's probably feeling a lot more than she's saying. Um, but I definitely feel like I saw, um, change in her. Um, and by the time I was in college and, um, and definitely by the time I was starting to raise children, she had grown into a fuller understanding of herself and willingness to, um, to communicate even when it was harder. So I think I saw some of that journey, but hearing this talk maybe highlighted it in a way that I hadn't seen before. And I didn't know how much she was a, aware or kind of analyzing her own story in this growth um, and how she was changing, but she was aware of it. Apparently it seems in the talk, she references it. So, um, so that's interesting, uh, to me. Um, and maybe I would want to connect that with, um, something very confusing about, um, that I still don't quite know how to understand or what to do with it in her life story. And that is in 2001, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And at that time she felt like it was really important to her to take a holistic, um, kind of homeopathic approach to treating it. So that involved getting her body in the best place possible to fight cancer cells, but that did not involve um, having the lump removed and doing chemo and radiation. And um, I remember when she shared that that was her decision, that that's the preference she had for how she wanted to be 
treated. It was very hard for my dad. Uh, and it was for, hard for us kids. Cause um, you know, the statistics and things at the time really had a high um, rate of success for breast cancer with the types of treatments that were available. And, and she felt like for her um, that was the right path for her to walk. And she, you know, from the time she was diagnosed till the time that she passed away, she had 13 years and, and she did a lot in those 13 years and had a full life still yet, even in that amount of time. Um, and I, and I really tried to support her and not, um, put pressure on her to, um, you know, to take the approach that other family members want her to take. I tried to accept, you know, what she decided, but there were times when it was hard and, and, um, I'm very grateful for all, for the time that we had with her those 13 years. And I feel very grateful for my relationship with her in general. Um, but there are times when I'm, I'm wondering like, what does it mean that she made this decision? And maybe there could have been more years had it been a, a different decision. Um, and she addresses it in her talk. Um, she, she mentions, um, and, and that was a part of interest you can imagine for me. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, she says, yes, about 2001, I found a lump in my breast. And so I went through finding out what it was. And then I became very pursuant of the topic of healing. And it's very true. Like she read a lot about healing and um, she really started to in focus on on passages of scripture that talked about God's provision and healing. And there was one that she um, quoted in her um, talk that was interesting. It was Exodus 15, 26. And um, it was kind of about God's covenant of healing with Israel. And they're out in the wilderness when, when God speaks these words or it's, it's presented to the people um, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, if you pay attention to his commandments and keep all his decrees, I will not bring any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And um, that ending, I am the Lord who heals you. I remember her asking me about that passage. And at the time, you know, I had taken Hebrew in seminary. And so I looked at the passage and, um, I recognized that it would, the, the form of the verb being used for heal there was kind of ongoing action, like a kind of unlimited, almost like a participle. Like, so you could translate it as I am the Lord who is healing you, you know, who continues the act of healing in you. And so that was very inspiring to her. And, um, she made that a part of her talk, like that. I believe God is working in my life and bringing healing and, um, and I think that God was active in her life, bringing healing uh, very powerfully during those 13 years. Um, but the very confusing thing is that um, the final doctor that worked with her um, before her passing, they eventually did um, perform a procedure to remove um, some of the growth in her lump. And But his comment was, and that was much later, that was after my dad had even passed away my dad passed away in 2012, his comment was, if we had found this sooner, if we had done something sooner, um, um, she wouldn't be at this stage where then it, it metastasized. And then ultimately, um, yeah, it would lead to, to her passing. And so it's so confusing because um, like she leaned on her faith and trusted in God's provision. And that was a huge blessing for her. And I saw that, um, but at the same time, like, um, she was reticent to, um, to go this other route uh, that, that where the medical treatment could have been, um, very helpful, but ultimately it was her decision. And I had to like, let go of that. And I guess I still have to let go of that. Right. <laughs> Maybe that's partly what, what the, the talk reveals is that she was at peace with that. And even, and she was very much at peace, um, before her passing, I was there with her and she was sharing that, um, she wanted to go home to be with the Lord and that she was at peace. And, um, and I, I mean, lots of friends came 
um, to see her before she passed some, probably a number of them from this time of this talk. And there was just such a piece about her when she was talking with them. And um, I don't know if I would say it was celebratory, but it almost felt like the, the, the mood was like a, like a, a party, like a being together and enjoying being together um, when some of these guests were there. And so you can probably sense in, in how I'm telling this story that hearing this talk is, is a complex thing for me. But at the end of the day that where I end up with it is in a place of gratitude. Like I, I know that her, um, her heart and what she valued and the path that she was walking was very fulfilling and the right and, and a blessing for her. And she blessed me and so many others. And even in these final, final years of her life. And so it's just the grief still, you know, and the sense of loss um, sits alongside that. And so sometimes you have to um, kind of practice some gratitude and refocus and to, to be like, Oh, but still um, it, her life was good. And, and this story is powerful. So, um, so I just shared a whole time with you, Barney, I'll, I'll stop here and give you a second to respond <laughs> Um, if I can, so. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as you describe kind of all that you were, um, feeling, um, when you, um, you know, received the CDs, maybe even the very first time and then found them again and got ready to listen to them. And then during the process of listening to them, and it makes me think that probably your mom didn't have any regrets. I don't think that she, I don't. I, I get the sense that she never really felt, oh, I really should have um, gone the medical route. But I, I really kind of sense that she knew and and really felt that she really made the right decision for whatever, whatever those reasons were. And I, I can, I can understand how, you know, you hearing more of what she shared during the talk kind of lends a little bit more um of her philosophy or her reasoning behind that but still leaves so many of those unanswered questions that you really want to know the more more detail about why you know the the why how how can you not be left with with more wise questions and and really wanting to know and and fully understand um e even though like i kind of sense that um you know it there's there's that that kind of tucked away place in our, our hearts where, where we do understand, but we just can't quite pick at, at what it is about that. And, um, in, in the end, after, after all that you went through and, and, and everything, um, maybe I'm left with maybe two questions. Um, the first one, um, are you glad that you listened to the CD and then the second one is, um, do you think that you'll listen to it again? Uh, yes. And yes, uh, I feel that the, um, the CD has been, um, challenging and stretching, but it's, it's been really helpful for me and it's kind of grounding to remind me of, um, who my mom was and, and who, I can be in this stage of my life and um, to try to embrace the, the growth of the aging process and to be a parent who, even though there can be ambiguities and um, when you're raising children that you try to make every effort to, to, to pour as much positivity and love and energy into that process of, of raising kids and, and um, to be open to them when they have feedback, um, and I do want to, if I can, before we close the podcast, um, share where, um, I think her talk ends up like kind mm -hmm. of the des destination point through the journey, mm -hmm. at least kind of what I hear and how it actually related, um, in a very interesting way to my own journey of grief, mm -hmm. specifically with my mom. Um, so, um, my mom passed away on August uh, 16th of 2014. And our third child, Hannah, was born on September 19th of 2014. And so my mom knew that she was coming. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we had, uh, even before my mom passed away, um, we had this time when we visited her. And at that point we hadn't picked out Hannah's name. We mm -hmm. knew Hannah was one of the names, um, that we were considering. And so we were telling her some of the names that we were considering. And I don't know if she didn't quite hear or if there's miscommunication or if it came to her, but anyway, she, she wanted to pray for Katie just that the rest of her pregnancy would go well. And so she, when she prayed, she, then she also prayed for baby Hannah and she, <laughs> and she said, um, Oh, I just want to hold her. I mm -hmm. want to live long enough to hold her. I remember when she was born, I was feeling so joyful and I, I went home and I was getting a few things and I was driving back to the hosp Worcester hospital where Katie was. And, uh, as I was going down this, um, the hill past where Kmart used to be in mm -hmm, Worcester, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I heard this, these words in my head from a scripture from revelations chapter 21. Um, it felt like God was speaking them to me. Behold, I make all things new. Mm -hmm. And as I heard those words, I had this image in my mind of my parents smiling. And it was mm -hmm. almost as if, um, God was saying like, you have lost someone dear to you out of your family, but just mm -hmm. as this dear loved one has gone out of your life, I've sent a new person, um, to be a part of your family and to enlarge your family. And, um, that was a very special moment for me. I may have even shared this with you already, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, it was a very powerful and, and healing moment for me, um, in the journey of, of grief. And it was, um, it was that experience of, of God making something new of making what I was grieving, um, a, be a, a new experience in light of this new life. And so I wanted to read a little bit, um, from what my grandma had to say, pardon me, for what my mom had to say about being a grandma and what mm -hmm. the grandchildren meant to her. And that is kind of like maybe a little bit of a final word mm -hmm. for a sense of hope and what's to come, even though she knew she, um, not when this talk happened, but even though in a fuller sense of time, she knew, she, um, her life was coming to the later part, the closing, the season, um, she still had this sense of hope in the grandchildren. So I, I'd like to just read a little bit of that if I can. And I'm going to share my screen again mm -hmm. and share a few pictures, um, of her with Micah and Aubrey, who were, um, a dear, uh, cherished part of her life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is her with Micah when he was young and, um, and as I tell us, I'm, I'm actually going to read, she tells a little story um, about somebody else in the church and it relates it to her grandkids. So mm -hmm. just give me a minute here. She says, I remember when my son graduated. Well, some of, you know, Don and Ann Meredith, they were members of the church. Mm -hmm. Well, their oldest son, Donnie um, came to my house soon after they had their first child. Her name was Hannah. She was the first grandchild and Johnny came back, uh, came by my house because I had ordered some things for the reception, uh, for the graduation party, which was for my graduation from yeah, high yeah. school, um, at our house. And he delivered them. And this was right after Hannah was born. And he says, he said, you know, my mother scares me. <laughs> I don't, I don't think this child is going to want for anything its whole life. And then my mom said, you know, it's, it's like something rises up. I don't know that because of these creations, these, these little children, you know, the, these little grandberry grandbabies there, it's tremendous. Um, she said, we, we have our son and his wife and they have a little boy who's two years old. And there he is pictured there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and um, and they're expecting in February. So I'm going to go ahead to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And this is in February oh. when, when our middle child, Arby was born. And she says, um, and what a blessing. 
something just rises up as a whole new world. It's something to live for and rejoice in to see their little lives. And they're so pure and innocent. And, and that was so true. Something would rise up in her. And she went on in her talk to talk about how being a grandparent would give her boldness. And she would think of those kids. She would just um, be bold and, and making plans to see them and, and be, be bold to when she's around them to, to make displays of her affection and love and um, to make sure that she communicated clearly to them how much she cared. And she really did care. And um, towards the end of her talk, she referenced um, this scripture that she and my dad would, had memorized and would say every evening before going to bed. Um, it was Psalm 103. And it talked about the Lord's provision and blessing. And, um, and she made a point in her talk to say, and his blessing is for us and it's for our children and it's for our children's children. <laughs> and that was such a powerful moment of hope. And, um, I really appreciated her sharing that, that, that she truly did feel blessed in her life. And she had a deep hope that that same feeling of blessing would be available to me and would be available to Micah and Aubrey and Hannah, and would even be available to our children's children. So even, um, those to come. So, mm -hmm. um, so all that to say, um, that the, the, there was, um, an intense period of listening to these CDs that brought me to a place of struggle and, and weightiness and hardship. But then there was a period of inspiration from listening to these CDs and, and it was, um, it was worth it. And, um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to uh, process this with you and, uh, thank you for listening and, and being interested. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's it's neat the the many levels of this talk because I think just um, you know some ordinary person someone like myself or someone um, you know from from any church or any you know one interested in the topic they would hear it I would hear it they would hear it and they would get a we would get a lot out of the talk just by the the topic and and your mom being such a great speaker I'm sure that it would really be inspiring for us and impactful for us. And then you have the the blessing and your family has the blessing of this extra level of hearing your mom's voice again, their grandma's voice speaking about um, herself, you know, being vulnerable and, and, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if it's best of all, but certainly a wonderful aspect of it is relating it all to faith and how important that was to her and to us and um, to the people listening um, along on the CD and listening along to here um, to us today. And um, was there anything that you wanted to, to close? Uh, any final thoughts that you had for today then, Jacob? Maybe just one other quote that, that came up in the CD that I, I didn't reference. Uh, and um, she, there's this part in the talk where she's talking about the idea of respect when you're raising children. And she was specifically talking about children in the teenage years and how it could be such a challenge, which is so timely because <laughs> um, we have two children in the teenage years. They're, they're very great and re respectful children and we appreciate them, but like there, are, there have been times over the course of a parenting where there are. Uh, you know, stressful moments and it can be hard, but she was talking about respect and she had this really interesting quote. Um, she says, um, we need, and, and, and she's talking now about, about our children and grandchildren. And she said, we, we need to treat them with respect and dignity and be in prayer for them and their children and their grandchildren. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming she's meaning as, as they age and then eventually mm -hmm. keep praying for them as they would have their own. Um, being in a position of humble prayer and, um, and then she goes on to say, um, our, our convictions are important, but love is a higher calling. Mm. And I thought, ah, oh, what a powerful statement. Like, um, yeah, sometimes our convictions lead us into conflict with our children or, mm. 
maybe in some cases, if, if you're a grandparent with grandchildren, you might disagree with certain um, decisions they make or situations that they're in. But, um, but this idea of love is a higher calling to not disengage um, and cut off relationship um, or withdrawal as much as possible when there's um, these hard things, but to try to keep out of a spirit of love and prayerfulness, keep seeking ways to work through it together and to pray and, um, and bless them. I thought, oh, what a powerful statement. And it speaks to me on so many levels right now, because, you know, in pastoral ministry, not only taking it out of the realm of just parenting, but in pastoral ministry, there are times in church life where there's conflict. And I can just see this, the wisdom and the statement um, that convictions are important, but love is a higher calling. Sometimes it's so true. Like in church life, we forbear with one another across our differences because we have a deep sense of love and commitment to one another. And um, so, yeah, that would be my final thought or final quote. Um, so thank you for asking. And then please feel free to, to close our time. Yeah, boy, what a, what a wonderful and insightful way to, to wrap things up too. Um, especially talk about family and, and um, those around us. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up in the moment and whatnot and to maybe lose sight. But yeah, oh boy, the higher calling most certainly is to, to focus on love. And uh, we're really thankful, we're grateful, and we love that you guys are listening together with us and watching along with us today. And um, we hope that, that today's talk about things that we've lost or misplaced, uh, forgotten about, and found again, and the flood of memories and emotions and whatnot that those um, inspire in us that we go through. Um, we hope that this has given you things to think about um, in your life, maybe things to remember. Maybe maybe you'll think back to this episode when you run across a similar um, situation or experience that what we've gone through today and talked about today. And um, we hope that, that it ends up being an equal blessing for you as well in your own experience. And, uh, as always, we're very thankful for you listening along with us. And we hope that you, as we are, are very excited for and looking forward to the next episode too. And we will see you all again then. This is our uh, Two World Podcast with Barney and Jacob. And thank you. <laughs>